Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. We learn together. This is your host Harish, and today I have bring you a history of a city called Berlin in Germany. Uh, as you know, the Berlin I only know about the football team in Berlin and the Berlin Wall. I heard about it, but I don't have any historical information about the city, uh, how it's made, what are the culture, how what events took place in the past. So to learn about those information, today we are looking at the. a uh, video called history of berlin made by kanubis uh, channel like them subscribe them also if you like this video don't forget to hit the like button subscribe to our channel and share your feedback in the comment section below let's go berlin is the capital and largest city of the federal republic of germany although younger than many of its fellow european capitals the city has still seen its fair share of world history frequently having been at the epicenter of many world events The thing about Berlin is that basically everything in it has a story to tell. I mean, how often does an airport's Wikipedia page have as detailed of a history section as Berlin Tegels? The area around Berlin was actually more or less left alone for much of European history. It came into Germanic hands during the 12th century as part of the Margraviate of Brandenburg, ruled by Albert the Bear or Albrecht der Bär, leading to the widespread assumption nowadays that Berlin's name and flag come from him. In regards to the name, this is likely not true, as Berlin's name is actually thought to stem from the old West Slavic Polabian term "berl," meaning swamp. But I take all these theories with a grain of salt. As you can probably tell, Berlin's early origins are quite vague. But the town first emerged on the Spree River, right on what is now Museum Island. Though we don't actually know when it was established, so people basically just decided 1237 was good enough. Berlin merged with neighboring Köln, not to be confused with Cologne, in 1432, creating the trade settlement simply known as Berlin Köln. The city was a Hanseatic free city until the death of Frederick I in 1440, upon which rule over the city was handed over to the Hohenzollern family, who would rule all the way up until 1918 as the Kaisers of Germany. Oh, sorry, spoilers. With the Hohenzollerns now in town, Berlin Köln became the royal residence of the Brandenburg electors, and thus it also had to give up its Hanseatic free city status. Over the next few centuries, Be- sorry guys, I didn't understand that. Just let me know what he explained. about that particular ruler Berlin Köln gradually started to grow as its relevance in German politics also started to grow. The elector started to use the Tiergarten as a hunting ground in 1530, the city officially became Lutheran in 1539, and the bubonic plague killed around 6,000 people in 1576, just a couple decades before the city reached a population of 12,000. The 30 years war, however, proved devastating to Berlin. with a third of the city's structures destroyed and half of its population killed but in 1640 Friedrich Wilhelm ascended to the throne and put forward a policy of immigration and religious tolerance growing the city to a size of 20,000 and developing a standing army making Berlin Köln finally a big player in central european affairs Then in 1701, Elector Frederick III became King Frederick III, building Schloss Charlottenburg and making the now fully united city of Berlin the capital of Prussia. Then they were conquered by Napoleon in 1806 for a bit until they were defeated in 1814, and then even harder with the help of Prussian troops in 1815. Once Germany was united as one country in 1871 under Prussian dominance, Berlin naturally found itself as the capital of the new German Empire. But there was one problem. It was kind of absolutely disgusting. I mean, sure, Berlin kind of has a reputation in Germany for not exactly being the cleanest of cities, but it didn't exactly fit that the capital of Germany's empire number 2 had no places for people's well, number 2. So the imperial government hired scientists, engineers, and city planners to work out a solution to this whole problem. And this is the point in which I realized this video might not get many views now that I've so much as mentioned the concept of science. <coughs> and the city quickly turned from a primitive backwater to an industrial era powerhouse. Aside from grand boulevards, government buildings and monuments, Berlin also saw construction of tenement houses, entertainment venues, and not just an Untergrundbahn, but also a Stadtschnellbahn. Also, fun fact, though this happened a little bit later on, Berlin was actually the first city to have a metro, or in this case, U-Bahn connection to its airport. somewhat ironic now i suppose now i'm kind of going to skim over world war 1 like i've been doing with basically everything else in my channel's entire career but suffice it to say that the war went quite badly for germany having been on the losing side 
As demanded by the Treaty of Versailles, Germany would be significantly shrunk in size, not be allowed to station troops in the Rhineland, have to pay a crippling amount of war debts, and disband their monarchy. In the place of the monarchy was the new Weimar Republic, of which Berlin remained the capital. Berlin during the 1920s became a cultural and scientific center, with many famous writers and scientists calling Berlin home. And the city's nightlife scene also started to grow. However, during these times, things still weren't all that great everywhere, and Germans still felt betrayed by everything that had just happened, and numerous different political factions started gaining more and more relevancy in national politics. Then in 1929, the economy crashed worldwide, and since Germany is indeed part of the world, their economy crashed too and made things even more sucky, especially for the 450,000 Berliners who just got laid off. One such aforementioned radical political party, the Yahtzee Party, didn't actually win the 1932 election. Decorated war veteran Paul von Hindenburg won the office of president, but he noticed Adolf Hodor's increasing popularity in the polls and his power in the German government, and so promoted him to chancellor, a position that Hodor gradually started to expand. Then, in 1933, a young staffer set the Reichstag on fire, and Hodor used this event to get the government to grant him emergency powers, until he established totalitarian rule over Germany and militarized the country for a rapid expansion across Europe. Hodor also had a lot of big ideas for Berlin, which he- Just to inform you, the person he's re re uh, referring to as Hodor is Adolf Hitler. Uh, I know you, you might have got that information instead of saying their name, he just translated the name as Adolf Hitler to Hodor. So don't get confused. He wanted to become his grand dream capital, Germania. It would have featured huge, prominent architectural works, including the Volkshalle or Großhalle, at the end of a widened Charlottenburger Chelsea, now Straße des 17. Juni, as well as numerous others. These structures were intended to be built in a style more or less reminiscent of ancient Greece and Rome, as those buildings came to represent civilizations that had lasted for thousands of years. But if you want a preview of what that architecture might have looked like, don't forget the Olympiastadion was built around this time for the 1936 Olympics in Berlin. Of course, while there were plans to completely rebuild Berlin, the city was a primary target for Allied bombers, and eventually, by 1945, the Allies had finally broken through, and Soviet generals Georgi Zhukov and Ivan Konyev commenced the race to Berlin. By the end of that April, Hodor had committed suicide, and a few days later, the Soviets had won the two-week-long Battle of Berlin. Once the dust had settled, the United States, Kingdom, Soviet Socialist Republics, and France had split Germany and Austria, as well as their capitals Berlin and Vienna. Austria was allowed to reunify itself pretty quickly, but the Soviets had quite different goals for Berlin and the other allies, with the USSR wanting to surround itself with a sphere of weakened puppet states, and the others wanting a strong ally that would never go back to... Yahtzeeism. This resulted in a split Berlin in the middle of a split Germany. Stalin assumed it would be an easy victory to just blockade West Berlin into submission, and now Allied shipments couldn't get to West Berlin. Yeah, that's kind of what blockades do. In response to this, the other allies decided to launch the Berlin Airlift, taking into account that shooting down a plane would be considered an act of war. And the airlift went on until the Soviets eventually backed down, West Berlin had been saved, and this whole mission had made it to the top of r slash madlads. After this, it was pretty clear that there would now be two Germanys. However, the new DDR government wasn't exactly warm to the concept of their citizens, who they had housed, fed, and educated their whole lives, just leaving for the richer West and not contributing to the economy. In response to this, what Wikipedia calls human capital flight, they decided enough was enough and built a wall all around West Berlin in 1961 to keep their own citizens in the East. This arguably tarnished the perception of the DDR on the world stage and was widely seen as a symbol of communist totalitarianism, though obviously it did stop the brain drain. After 28 years of all this, the DDR government decided to gradually loosen the travel restrictions, which Press Secretary Gunter Szabowski was tasked with announcing when he misspoke and accidentally opened the gates. For more information, do watch this video I made about this whole event that basically no one watched. Then Berlin was remade into the capital of Germany, and it was decided that the old Reichstag building, which up until this point was in the middle of no man's land, would be renovated and made into the German parliament building fit with a publicly accessible dome placed symbolically above the nation's politicians. 
So yeah, obviously I had to leave out quite a few things, even besides all the stuff that I've already mentioned in my other videos, but as mentioned earlier, basically everything in Berlin has a story. Berlin's airports have a story, one's local U-Bahn station has a story, one's neighborhood has a story, and those little gold stones in the sidewalk have a bit of a more morbid story that should never be forgotten. If you ask me, it's kind of interesting to think that a city as relatively new as Berlin has such a long and detailed story to tell. Granted, thousand-year-old Potsdam is probably sulking right next to them, but still. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm. Oof. That's it for the video, guys. I hope you like this video. Uh, there was so much information, which I find it interesting. Like, the first metro was started in, in Berlin, and it was until 1937. That's a new fact which I was not aware of. Second thing, in the history books we learn about Germany but I was not aware there was a time when there was two Germany, East Germany, West Germany. I didn't know about that information. Um, the maid, Berlin Wall was made in 1961. And apart from that there was so much information that he missed out like he said in, in the video. I hope you like this video. Please don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe to our channel and share your feedback in the comment section below. Uh, as I said earlier, if you have any city or country you would like us to review their history and culture, please mention that in the country name in the, in the comment section below. We'll try our best to bring a, a, a video about that country and their culture. I hope you have learned something new with this video. Till next time, see you. Bye bye.